Lord our shepherd and the fact that if we are Christians, we are sheep in his fold. And that fits so well with the parable that we're going to be examining this evening. God willing, this series will close next Sunday night with the final examination of the parable of the Good Samaritan, if you actually pay any attention to those kinds of things. The last Sunday evening of the month, uh, Brad uh, Pierce is going to be our speaker. I almost said Brad Forshee, and that would have given Brad heart attack. Brad Pierce uh, will be our speaker uh, on the 30th, I believe it is. I do that a lot. Names, uh, I think of one name and another comes out. Shouldn't really surprise you. I do it with my own kids and my grandchildren, so when it happens here, it's just pretty well routine for the course. The parables of our Lord were stories designed to convey spiritual and heavenly messages using things that everyone understood and giving them that application or meaning. Throughout most of the history of human civilization, it has been an agricultural society. Certainly that was true throughout the entire Bible and in fact true even in our own nation's history up until the Industrial Revolution. And so these kinds of things would register with the folks who first heard them and for many who came after rather easily. Today there's far less understanding among the masses as to how things are grown and uh, how animals are raised and where our food actually uh, originates. And so the things that were so common then are not so common today. The separation of sheep and goats was a very ordinary process in the first century. A man's wealth was often measured by his livestock. And the more goats and the more sheep you have, the wealthier you were. But even the poorest generally had some livestock necessary for their existence. All the way back in the book of 2 Samuel when Nathan confronts David regarding his sin. He told the story of the poor man who had a single little lamb and his neighbor who was very rich with large flocks and herds. And you know that story well, and uh, its meaning is fairly obvious, but that's just the kind of rural environment we're dealing with throughout the biblical period. The story that serves as the basis of this parable uh, conveys the following. Jesus wants to impress upon his hearers the nature of the impending judgment. And he does so by means of the shepherd and his sheep. The depiction of this judgment is the great white throne judgment described in Revelation chapter 20 when Jesus comes with his angels. You have reference to it, and we'll note in a few minutes, a passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 that actually borrows on this same theme. The separation between sheep and goats is the depiction of the judgment that will occur at the end. All of mankind is represented under one of these two figures. And so I could say to you quite honestly tonight, all of us, are either sheep or goats. And if we are sheep, that's a compliment. If we're an old goat, that's not a good thing. If we are sheep in the story, we're on the right hand of God and ultimately will be blessed. And if we are goats, we're on the left hand and uh, will be condemned. What's really striking in this parable is the criteria for judgment. We generally think of the lost as those who do terribly wicked things. And of course, if you're students of the Bible, 
you know that Revelation closes with a reminder that all liars and, and those who do wicked deeds will be cast into the lake of fire. But in this parable, and in fact, if memory serves me correctly, in all of the parables and teachings of Jesus that deal or address the subject of judgment, people are not lost because they've done terribly wicked things. They are, as in this case, lost because they failed to do the right thing. The sheep on the right are addressed by the judge. I was hungry and you fed me, thirsty and you gave me water. I was sick and you ministered to me, in prison and you visited me. You know the drill. And their response was, Lord, when did we ever see you in this condition and minister to you? And he said, inasmuch as you did it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. But to the goats who are on the left, I was hungry and you did not feed me, thirsty and you didn't give me water, naked and you didn't clothe me. And their response was, Lord, when did we ever see you in such dire straits and not come to your rescue? It didn't happen, but it did. For inasmuch as you did it not unto one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. And the point that he's making is simply this. We serve him when we serve one another. We serve him when we help those who are in need. And when we fail to extend that assistance to those who are genuinely in need, we're failing our Savior. So what Jesus is saying is that our inaction can ultimately lead to our condemnation when opportunities present themselves to serve we need to serve, or when judgment occurs, we will find ourselves separated from the redeemed, separated from those who have lived and served Jesus faithfully in this life by serving the people around them. So there is obviously in this parable of judgment a call for us to sit up and take notice of the fact that throughout all of biblical history, God has always expected his people to be conscientious in meeting the needs of the less fortunate. Now, when I say that, I need to stop and remind you that he is not saying that our responsibility is to encourage those who refuse to help themselves. Our responsibility falls on those who cannot help themselves or who try and still need assistance. It is not in any way a suggestion that we ought to encourage laziness or idleness. And if you have questions about that, I would urge you to read his letters to the church at Thessalonica. In the first letter, he urges readers to work with their hands, that is, to do things that are meaningful and productive so that they can provide for their, their own needs and then the needs of the less fortunate. And in his second letter, he concludes by making the argument that if one will not work, he shouldn't eat, and in fact, we are doing wrong in encouraging laziness or idleness. But where there is genuine need, we must respond with compassion. You may recall the words of John in 1 John chapter 3 when he wrote in 17 and 18 about seeing someone in need and not being compassionate toward them. The question is, how does the love of God dwell in such a person? And the answer is, it doesn't. And so he pleads, my little children, that's all of us if we're Christians, let us not love in word and in tongue. That is, let's just not talk about love. The meaning would encompass the word exclusively. Make sure that your love is not just expressed in words, but in deed and in truth, that is, genuine love will inevitably produce actions that are meaningful and helpful. 
And where those actions do not occur, love does not reside in the heart. Now, all of that is about the judgment that is to come and what ultimately will be the fate of every person. And that fate is determined by whether or not we help those in need. That's not the only criteria, but it certainly is a very important one in connection with this subject. Now, I want to quickly give you uh, just some examples of the emphasis that Scripture brings to judgment that spring from the parable that uh, Cohen read a few moments ago and is the focus of our study. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Paul said, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And then in verse 11, he went on to say, Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. In essence, he's saying relative to the parable that we're considering, you do not want to be a goat come judgment day. Because the fate of goats is not good. And at all costs, you should desire to escape that fate and as one of his sheep, hear his wonderful and glorious pronouncement, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. Because it is a fearful thing to face God unprepared. He is truly a consuming fire for those who are not ready. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23, he references judgment, saying, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, What day is that? The day that is described in this parable. The day of judgment that is predicted throughout the New Testament in that day. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name do many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who work iniquity. And I can't help but think of that passage when I see what unfolds so often today as religion in our world. It is so much today about entertainment and meeting the felt needs of the worshipers and often has little to do with what God's word demands of God's people and what's required of us to be prepared for judgment. I do not come to settings like this to be entertained, but I will tell you frankly that many other people do and that those groups that seem to collect the largest crowds on the Lord's Day are by and large those who are providing the most exciting entertainment. That is not what God demands. And so on judgment, there are going to be many who will say, Lord, we were there every Sunday. We danced in the aisles. We clapped and shouted and raised our voices. We blended with the band. It was exciting. It was emotional. But it wasn't what God demanded. Do you want to face judgment having done what the Lord desires or what you desire to do? See, that's the question. And the answer is most people want to do what they want to do without regard to what the Lord has demanded. They are not then prepared for judgment. They will say, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We, done many, we did many wonderful things. And he'll be compelled to say, but I don't know you. Because you didn't do what the Father demanded. And we're here to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Both are essential. Yes, we need to be excited. We need to be enthusiastic. We need our worship to be from the heart. We also need to make sure that it's what God dictates, not what we desire, or judgment will hold no real promise for us. In John 12, 48, Jesus made this statement. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. 
The words which I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Do you see the correlation between Matthew 7 and John 12, 48? It's all about what the Father wants, not what we want. In Romans 14, 10, Paul again reminds his readers that we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And then in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, in so many ways it parallels the, the message in Matthew 25. The Son of Man will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're troubled, if you're being tested and tormented and persecuted as saints were throughout the history of the New Testament church, know one day that there will be a time of reckoning. That God is a just God. And those who persecute the saints will ultimately incur his wrath. We take no delight in that. There is no joy in that thought. Our delight and our joy comes in the realization that no one need be lost, that all can prepare for impending judgment. And if ready, as we sometimes sing, there's a great day coming. It is when we are unprepared that this day is fraught with fear, heartache, and misery. But he's coming with his mighty angels, even as depicted here in Matthew 25. And he will take vengeance on them that do not know God and do not obey the gospel. Hebrews 9, 27 simply says it's appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. Hebrews 10, 26 through 31 reminds us that if we sin willfully after that, we've received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. Then he went on to describe that how under the law of Moses, those who transgress received the just recompense of their reward. They could not escape the consequences of their errors. The same will be true in the New Testament dispensation as well. And then, as we have already noted, the Bible closes in Revelation 20 with a depiction of the final judgment, the great white throne judgment, when all are gathered before him and the separation occurs. And those on his left will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, the bottomless pit, which is the second death, the place prepared for the devil and his angels. We call that place hell. And if there is a heaven, and there is, there must also be a hell, and there is. And when judgment comes, a verdict will be rendered. What will this final judgment be like? Well, there are only two possibilities. The only verdicts, lost, saved. No middle ground, no probation, just simple, lost or saved. Here's what I know about that judgment from what the scriptures say. No excuses will be accepted. Lord, I intended all my life, I planned. I just never got around to getting ready. Sorry. Too late, too bad. That excuse is defined as the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. There's no excuse for our failure to obey Jesus and prepare for eternity. Now, in our courts, there are what are sometimes called legal loopholes. Perhaps someone has not read their Miranda rights and the case is thrown out. Perhaps 
evidence has been tainted because the chain of evidence has not been followed correctly. There are all kinds of legal loopholes in our modern system, but before God's judgment, there will be none. If you're thinking that you can get off on a technicality in this judgment, that will not happen. And furthermore, there's no appeal to a higher court. We have an appeal process in our judicial system, and that's important and serves a valid purpose. Ultimately, a case may go to the Supreme Court. But there's no appealing the verdict on this day. It is in every sense final. And furthermore, there will be no mistake. I have no doubt, ladies and gentlemen, that there are innocent people incarcerated in our jails and prisons right now. Not nearly as many as you might imagine, because if you visit, they're all innocent. I visited. I can't find a single time when somebody just said, I did it, I deserve it, I got what was coming to me. They may be out there, but they're a rare breed. But in this case, there are not going to be any mistakes. Nobody will be lost who should be saved, and nobody will be saved who should be lost in the final judgment. And there are not going to be any second chances. I believe that our God is not a God of second chances. I believe he is a God who gives us all the opportunities we need, this side of the grave, eternity and judgment. But when life is over, opportunities cease. There are no more chances. And if we don't seize the moment, we won't have any hope. When this day comes, and it is coming, it's over. No wonder Paul pleaded with the saints at Corinth, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It's no run wonder that the Hebrews writer would urge that we give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Lest at any time we should let them slip, for if the words spoken by angels prove steadfast and every transgression or dis and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And the answer is that we will not. It is the judgment that compels me in my preaching and teaching to be as plain as I can be. It is so hard to say things that I know are upsetting. It is so hard to deal with topics that I know that are hard to wrestle with, and especially in our culture, in our day. But they have to be said, and we have to hold the truth. We must always be kind, caring, loving, but we can't sidestep the plain and simple teaching of God's Word about how to worship acceptably, how to live uprightly, as we spoke this morning from Colossians 3, what we have to do to be saved. And in all of those areas where we're dealing with essentials, we've got to do it with a clarity, with a conviction, with kindness, so that people will have the opportunity to make the right choice. And when we contemplate judgment, we are contemplating a final verdict where no more chances will be available. We had better be ready. And if not, the question will be, who do we blame? You, we play the blame, blame game all the time, don't we? I read, oh, probably 40 years ago, and I don't remember where, but it was just a little ditty. He wrecked his car, he lost his job, yet throughout his life he took his troubles like a man and blamed them on his wife. Isn't that so apropos, though? Don't we tend to blame everybody else and don't want to accept responsibility for ourselves? 
have been watching as, as little as I can what's playing out in Washington right now. And Cohen's blaming it. Cohen. Is, is that his name, the lawyer? I, I just went blank on it. Anyway, John Sand. He's blaming the president. And what does the president do? He blames everybody else. Uh, you know, if you're not impressed with the fact that they're all humans, uh, just watch them in action. You figure that out pretty soon. And, and, and I can't find politicians anywhere that will just accept responsibility. Every one of them wants to blame somebody else for whatever they're dealing with. Doesn't matter what it is, it's not my fault. Well, don't fault them overly much because that's pretty much human nature. There's a tendency on the part of humans to never or almost never admit personal responsibility. But what does the Bible teach? Just the opposite, that we are responsible for our choices and that those choices have consequence. When I think about judgment, eternity, and the lost, I know that God is not at fault here. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 2 4 wrote regarding God, it was his desire that all men might come into a knowledge of the truth and be saved. There is no one pulling harder for us to be with him eternally. Than God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus was dispatched from heaven to earth to make that possible. Our world still stands today because God longs for his creation to be with him. And so Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 3 that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. He's just saying time doesn't matter. To the maker. But he is long suffering, exceedingly patient, unlike so many of us that are exceedingly impatient. Aren't you glad God is a patient God? Exceedingly patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So I can't blame God if I am lost. He has provided for my salvation in the person of his son, his precious gift, what Paul called in 2 Corinthians 9, 15, his unspeakable gift. The question is, how do I respond to that gift? Well, if I can't blame God, Christ, or the Holy Spirit, maybe I can blame the preacher, my parents, friends, you ever notice how when a teenager gets in trouble, it's always, he's just running with the wrong crowd. It's his friends. Do you ever? I'd like to meet the one bad apple who's responsible for corrupting all these young people. Folks, that's just an excuse. We choose who we run with. We choose who we allow to influence us. It's our choice. We're not going to be able to blame the preacher or the elders, or the Bible school teacher, or mom and dad, or anybody else. If we are lost, we have no one to blame but ourselves. We can't even blame the devil. You say, now how is that possible? Because the devil, frankly, is powerless until we give in to him. Resist him, and he will flee from you. It's that simple. So what do we do? Sadly, again, rather than resist, we embrace and then want to blame him. We have no one to blame for ourselves if we end up with the goats, not the sheep, and are separated from the Father, the Son, the Spirit, and the redeemed for ceaseless, endless ages. In a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, where there is complete and total darkness and eternal remorse and regret. I really and truly believe that come Judgment Day, all that we've heard will come back to us, good or bad. 
what a terrible tragedy to have heard the gospel over and over again and perhaps even said within yourself, someday I'm going to obey and then die and perish eternity, eternally and spend eternity regretting what might have been if only. So who or what determines the final outcome? <laughs> you decide. I close with the words of Joshua to the nation of Israel who simply said, Choose ye this day whom you will serve. He said, You can serve the gods of the Amorites, the gods of the Egyptians, the gods in the land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. That choice that prepares us for eternity for the judgment that is to come, and for being one of those on the right to whom Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant. And there are a whole lot of things that come into play, but in the parable, it was all about feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, ministering to the sick, visiting those who are imprisoned, alone, and abandoned and conveying the love of God through the life we lead, the service we render. What's eternity look like for you? You're going to be a sheep or a goat? You may well tonight, this very moment, determine the outcome of the final judgment by your response to the gospel of Christ as to 